Good morning. My name is Jorge Soberon from the University of Kansas, and I will be um, discussing some theoretical perspectives on the problem of distributional equilibria of niche modeling. The problem I will be discussing with you this morning is a problem uh, that some people refer to as overprediction. That means when, that when you do a niche modeling and you project it into geography, often you get a larger prediction than uh, what is observed uh, in the data. To the right of the slide, there is one classic example of this, uh, was uh, presented by Svenning and Skob. Uh, it is the, the, the distribution of a, of a fur in Europe. Uh, the points are the observations and the gray area is what the niche model predicts. And what, as you can see, it looks larger than the data. In the early days of, of uh, this, um, this area of, of research, niche modeling distributions or species distribution modeling, uh, some people regarded this uh, over prediction as something really terrible and very bad and we think that that's just a matter of um, well setting the framework right um, we have discussed the BAM diagram like many many times uh, we are going to do it again uh, you remember that there is the intersection of three circles the green and the yellow are respectively the, the biotic and the abiotic conditions. The intersection of the two gives you the region of the world where the species can live, but that doesn't mean that it lives there. For that, we, you need another circle, which is the M circle, and that circle means uh, the areas that the species has been able to occupy from some, uh, we will talk about it later, some uh, properly stated initial condition. So a niche model is not really the model of the actual distribution. It's a model of the regions in the world or in, in a particular area that are suitable for a particular species. Uh, it's a, a, the, the projection of the niche model that you create on geography is a potential area. To get to the actual distribution, you need also to know the capacity for movements and the ancestral region where the species moved. Um, and of course, interactions that we don't mention too often because we don't know much about them. Probably they are very important, but we don't know much about them. I'm going to repeat something that many instructors have um, stressed. Modeling a niche is not the same thing as modeling a distribution. SDMs are not the same as ENMs. Uh, you can model the fundamental niche from physiological experiments and the realized niche using ecological niche modeling, like Maxent, but the distribution needs more. Distributions include factors like movements, barriers, climate change, interactions, habitat structure, a lot of things. Uh, some optimistic people uh, hope that this will be captured statistically when you do a maxent or a or a or a gleam or a gam or anything uh, others like well myself included think that uh, the, the, those parts are tend to be um, um, finely grained and therefore we call them deltonian noise we hope that those factors are going to act basically as noise when you do your modeling and perhaps, as it happens very often in biology, both parts have some part of reason. This matters, so I'm going to give you an example. In, the, in this uh, graph that you are looking at, there is uh, the environmental space of that region of the world, the Western Hemisphere, uh, in two variables, which are principal components. And um, the little red uh, rectangle is a hypothetical niche. And if you capture that part of, of environmental space and you project it into geography, you get some something in southern Chile. But if you uh, move the same rectangle to the right so that it encompasses uh, a, a denser part of niche space, what you get is what you see now. It's a tremendous amount of, uh, of land which is unconnected, but that correspond to the same niche. 
and you can see that even Hawaii is included in this in this particular niche. So if if your niche is uh, that little red rectangle in the part of the niche space that I am showing, you will get a very weird distribution, uh, including parts where for sure the species does not exist. Finally, if you move your same rectangle somewhere else, what you get is two extreme distributions, one in Chile and the other one in the northern, northwestern United States, southwestern Canada. So, summarizing. If you want to do a proper uh, distribution, model a proper distribution, considering the, the, the movements, you need to know how much the species move, which is difficult because you need to estimate dispersal kernels, and then you also need to know where from the distribution began, the ancestral range, which is maybe very, very difficult. Besides, there are some, some cases. In this case, we are illustrating a situation where the species is just beginning to invade a region. Uh, in the left side, the initial time, the, the species concentrated in the geography in the southernmost part of the diagram. But if you allow enough time, the species would be able to spread. This is a formally identical case, but biologically different. This is a case where some barrier was uh, overcome. For instance, maybe the species was transported across the Atlantic on a ship or something like that. Suddenly, uh, the species found itself with a much larger M area uh, occupying suitable space, and it may start spreading. One can make static hypothesis about the interaction between um, movements and niche. Uh, take the example below. It's about uh, the, the maroon-fronted parrot from Mexico. Uh, and a niche, a simple niche model will give you that area that you see in the map in green. Uh, it, it is um, very over-predicted because it includes large regions in, the, in, in Mexico and Central America and the United States where the species does not occur. One possible way of dealing with this problem is to have a hypothesis about how far the species is able to move and, and then classify the little pixels that are um, highlighted in green uh, according to the, the possibilities of the species to distribute. If you assume that uh, it's a very, um, that it can only disperse to immediate neighbors, you get 40 patches which are suitable in that region of the world. But if you speculate that more and more neighbors are available, if you go to the right of the, of the scatter plot to about 30, then the entire region is available to the species, a single single uh, patch. To, to make this clear, I'm going to give you a, another example, same idea. You have the species Urania boizubali in Cuba, you do the niche modeling and the niche modeling is a spattering of, of, of green areas. If you assume that your animal, in this case the moth, is capable of moving just to the closest neighbor, the closest pixel, then you have hundreds of, of uh, little possible areas of distributions which are isolated one from the other. But if you allow more the capacity to spread farther away, for instance, 16 pixels, then the entire thing is a single patch. So, um, and each model from the perspective of the movements of a species look different. You can constrain your uh, your M uh, by by biological knowledge. This is an example by uh, uh, Jacob Cooper. Uh, it was done uh, in collaboration with uh, Mark Robbins of the of the Museum of, of uh, Natural History here at the University of Kansas. For that little hummingbird there, uh, the the points are of course the occurrences and the niche model. The, the unconstrained niche model, as you can see, includes a largish area in, towards uh, in Venezuela or maybe towards the Guyanas. But if you constrain the area, if you propose a hypothesis about what has been uh, reachable 
to this species, you get a completely different prediction, uh, as you see in the in the image. And of course, if you um, overlay, if you superimpose many the distributions for many species, you get in blue to the very far right, uh, in blue, very good predictions of the areas of, of, of the composition of, of a fauna in a particular place in comparison with the unconstrained projection which over predicts too much. Now the preceding examples have been static. We just propose a value for m or a region of m one way or another and um, pr preferably based on the on the capacities of a species to move that you would know and then uh, you you have your prediction of an m but there is another way which is by doing a dynamic model um, right now we have a couple of examples of that this is a cellular automaton where you begin with the area of distribution uh, symbolized by a G for species J. And then in the simplest case, you multiply it by a matrix that represents movements. But then you can also multiply it by a matrix that represents whether a given pixel belongs or not to the fundamental niche of a species. You would get that from ecological niche modeling. And if you are lucky enough and you have information about the biotic interactions, you can still multiply it by a third matrix, which is the B matrix. And then you will have a, a complete model of the BAM diagram, but dynamic. And this is an example for, uh, for, um, um, from a little J in Mexico. Uh, when you start spreading, applying the equations I just showed, you see the green area that start showing the spread of the of the of the of the bird. Now, that requires that you specify a starting point, which is the one um, pointed by the arrows. But if I had just chosen a different starting point, I may have gotten a completely different distribution, a totally different distribution. So it is very important to realize that in the second you start speculating about movements, you need to specify the initial uh, point, the ancestral origin of the species. To conclude, if you really want to have a true species distribution model, you need hypotheses about M, which are the movements, not just about uh, the, the xenopoietic niche, which is the A circle. And of course, you would also like to have data about the biotic interactions. The M has a double importance because it is important for some software and the most popular software in the world, which is Maxent, requires that you specify uh, the area where the background points are going to be obtained because that's where the uh, Maxent is going to use to maximize the relative entropy. Uh, so if you change your area of reference, you change your Maxent output. Specifying M is part of the modeling process, and it's better to get a biologically based M and not just as some people often do by political borders. But the second thing is that uh, every niche modeling, be Maxent or any other, would predict a potential distribution. And if you have a hypothesis about M, then you can uh, constrain your prediction by M and this reduces your prediction problem sometimes substantially and this can be done statically but I think I believe that the best way of doing it is by so parts of your niche model may be unoccupied because the species is still expanding at a low speed or because there are barriers or because a barrier was removed or a competitor excluded and the expansion just started or maybe climate changed, or there are many other reasons. That some parts of the projection in geography of a niche model are not occupied does not mean that the niche model is wrong. Maybe one of the things above is happening. Uh, improving our area of research or field will require better ways to estimate M and a good dynamical modeling that includes uh, all parts of the BAM scheme.